One night in 1999, Nagrani and Katrival were sleeping with their three children when Satish went missing from his bed. He was discovered in the Netherlands several years later. Satish was among several children stolen by an orphanage and sent out for adoption. His Dutch parents had paid the orphanage 35,000 US dollars. Nagrani and her lost child managed to make news as she had NGOs supporting her. There are many Nagranis and Satishas who are lost in oblivion. We only wake up when there is a horrifying, blood-curdling incident. We rush to the streets to express our concern, seek stringent laws and call for death for every criminal involved in these dastardly acts. But soon enough, these incidents are obliterated from public memory until the next breaking news horror story takes over. Despite reports almost every day, with time we have become immune to the stories of exploitation of girls from Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh by placement agencies and touts. Lured by the temptation of dignified jobs or secure marriages, these girls end up with domestic servitude, prostitution or extremely violent marriages to more than one man in states that have finished off their own girls. News of bonded child labour rescues by organisations like Bachpan Bachao Andolan and sex rackets unearthed by NGOs like Shakti Vahini are reported in mainstream media, yet public minds are inured to them. The pain of each story lost in the deluge of relentless newsprint and 24-7 news stickers. It took a Nithari carnage with children's bones found in a drain for the country to wake up to children going missing. The truth is, children are being bought and sold in this country every minute, every day. No region or state is exempt. Either it is a supply state or a receiving one. In 2000, Huck Center for Child Rights undertook a study on child trafficking in India. Back then, trafficking was synonymous with women and girls for prostitution. The study sought to widen the discussion to include both boys and girls and understand the multitude of forms and purposes for which children were bought and sold. This study initiated the formation of the National Campaign Against Child Trafficking CACT, in 2001 with partners in 13 states. CACT's active engagement with policy reform brought recognition to all forms and purposes of child trafficking for the first time in the Government of India's National Plan of Action for Children 2005. Internationally too, the Government of India took a big step towards a larger understanding of trafficking by ratifying the UN Protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons in 2011. It was time to change the domestic law accordingly. This became visible with the inclusion of a distinct legal provision in the Indian Penal Code to deal with human trafficking as part of the criminal law enacted after the Nirbhaya gang rape case in December 2012. Sixteen years after the last situational analysis and post several developments in policy and legal framework, called for an update to see what has really changed. This study in 2016 sadly reiterates the adage that the more it changes, the more it remains the same. The National Crime Records Bureau tells us that a child goes missing every eight minutes. This is a national emergency, with almost every corner of the country turning into a Nithari. This has all 36.68% of India's population, our children, at risk. To add to this, as a 2013 UNODC report on India says, trafficking rackets and gangs have become more organized and expanded into newer forms of trafficking. In 2015, eight women were nabbed by the Odessa Railway Police for kidnapping children for begging. It has taken years for the police to recognize the organized nature of begging and what it entails. Children are kidnapped physically assaulted and forced to beg. Some are taken on rent at the rate of about 200 to 300 rupees per day and in some cases given sedatives 
so that they are unconscious, said the additional commissioner of police, Bangalore. In an ongoing PIL, the Supreme Court of India has recognized how children are initiated into drug use and then forced to work for traffickers. Use of children for smuggling drugs is a common occurrence on Indian borders. Post the 2015 Nepal earthquake, children aged 10 to 15 years were rampantly used to smuggle essential goods and petroleum by traders. Over the years, exporting children into the international market for adoption has become that much easier and safer or at least more legal than ever before. Parents wanting to adopt now register online. They can choose a baby from the pictures uploaded on the Caring's website of Government of India. If a child is rejected thrice by an Indian parent, she, he automatically goes into the inter-country adoption. On the other hand, if a prospective Indian adoptive parent rejects three children, they automatically go into the waitlist, only to eventually be forced to resort to illegal adoption. The numbers of children that go missing from nursing homes and hospitals is unknown. But that this happens is an open secret. Incredible India, India Shining, India Inc, Skill India, Digital India, Make in India, all these make us proud. Indeed, India is going global and so are Indian children. One lot of Indian children going global end up in the best of international universities for higher education. The other lot are trafficked as cheap labour and sex objects to 18 countries across the globe, to South Asia, Africa, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Pacific Islands and Europe. The country is not unaware of the issue of trafficking. Every year, questions on trafficking are asked in the parliament. Interest from members of parliament in this issue has been increasing. Most questions relate to the gravity of the problem, the numbers and the response. The answers are deja vu. Almost every answer lists out the government schemes, the number of anti-human trafficking units or AHTUs set up and the advisories and protocols drafted for various stakeholders to follow. It seldom addresses the real human interest issues at hand. In another irony, with increased specialization of services, the response to child trafficking too has become super specialized. The 200 plus AHTUs set up across the country are supposed to rescue children from their traffickers, carry out investigations and tie up with government services and NGOs for rehabilitation of the victims. With the setting up of these specialized anti-trafficking units, the role of local police stands minimized to the extent that they are unable to even provide reliable data on the extent and magnitude of the problem. Interestingly, neither can the specialized AHDUs provide such data. Most AHDUs refuse to respond to RTI applications on the grounds that they are not covered by the RTI Act. As for those who do share data, the figures do not match the data from other government sources including the National Crime Records Bureau. Even in the National Capital Territory of Delhi, response to RTI applications reveal serious discrepancies in the data from the Delhi Police and the AHTUs. Often, poor law enforcement and delays in judicial procedures make life hell for those children who do survive trafficking. This is mostly true of the rehabilitation efforts made by the government or NGOs. Very often, they too fail to bring the desired change in the lives of the victims. In fact, the multiplicity of agencies and the absence of cohesion often leads to confusion and ends up increasing the trauma of victims and their families. The next time a Sita or a Farida or a Ramu or a Chotu needs help, who should they go to? The local police or the district AHTU? Should information about a missing child be uploaded on the MWCD's Khoya Paya web portal or the Home Ministry's Stop Trafficking web portal? Which of these will generate an immediate response and assistance? 
Swoop down and rescue is the mantra. Also, send the child back and forget about it. Kidnapped, bought and sold like faceless cattle. Also, rescued and sent home like a nameless herd. How often is the individual trauma even considered or cared for? Ultimately, is there a difference in the way traffickers and protectors actually treat children? It is critical to get to the source. Can we take a pledge to prevent children from being trafficked in the first place? And for those who do fall out of the social security and protective net, can we resolve to activate a well-coordinated, efficient strategy and information sharing plan? Unless, of course, the competing interests are so compelling that we feel children can wait for another life.